Are you ready to be spooked? Well, ready or not, today we're going to talk about cursed, haunted swords. For this video idea, I take no credit. It was suggested by Vitrio Man, Dr. Bright, and probably others in the community post. I liked it enough that here we are. So we'll first take a look at historical references to cursed swords. And I use the term historical loosely because people in the past didn't separate fact from fiction the way we like to nowadays. And reality and myth were often interwoven. Then afterwards, we're going to talk about two modern examples of haunted swords. You might have heard of Tyrfing. No, not the Viking metal band from Sweden. It's the name of a magic sword in Norse mythology. It also appears in several games. We'll get back to that later. What was Tyrfing supposed to look like? Well, in short, no idea. There doesn't seem to be a description of what it looked like. We only know that the hilt was supposed to be gilded. There are plenty of fancy examples from history. It might have looked something like this, perhaps, if it ever existed. It all starts with King Svafrlami, son of Sigurlami, who in turn was supposed to be a son of Odin. He meets two dwarves, Dvalin and Dulin. They are Svartalvar, black elves, as it literally translates. Think of them as modern fantasy dwarves mixed with drow, mixed with gargoyles. Uh, they are short underground dwellers with pitch black skin, renowned craftsmen. Uh, they can turn to stone if caught by sunlight, and they're also known to be wise and knowledgeable in magic. Uh, they made many powerful artifacts for the Aesir. Thor's hammer, Mjölnir, Odin's spear, Gungnir, the magic chain, Gleipnir, the only thing strong enough to bind the wolf Fenrir. So the king captures them and demands that they make him a sword with a golden hilt that can cut iron and never rusts. They do, and the sword is called Tyrfing. It can even cut into stone. However, before they leave, Dvalin curses the sword, saying that it will cause a death every time it's drawn, it will cost the king his life, and it will cause three evil deeds. Hervara Saga says it must be sheathed with human blood still warm on its blade. Good thing it can't rust, huh? Because that's how you get rust on your blade. For a while, it serves him very well. He wins every battle and duel with it. Eventually, a man named Arngrim raids his kingdom, meets Svafrlami in battle, cuts off his hand, takes Tyrfing and kills him with it. Arngrim's sons were all berserkers. One of them, Angantyr, inherits Tyrfing. He is eventually killed by a man named Hjalmar, who also dies of the wounds inflicted by Tyrfing. That's the first evil deed. Then there's the shield maiden Hervor, who dresses as a man and joins a band of Vikings, becomes the commander when the current chief dies. She ends up summoning Angantyr's tormented spirit. She wants to take Tyrfing from his tomb. He warns her that there will be a curse on her and her descendants, but unperturbed she takes it anyway. One time, while she is giving advice on how to play a game of chess, probably Nefetov, someone picks up Tyrfing and draws it. She takes it out of his hand and kills him with it. Eventually she retires from the Viking business, marries and has children. She gives Tyrfing to one of them, Heidrek. When he draws a sword, presumably just to look at it, he is with his brother named Angantyr after the previous owner of the sword. He has no intention of using it, but Dvalin's curse makes him go into a blind berserker rage, so he cuts down his brother right there. That is the second evil deed. Heidrek grieves and lives in the woods by himself for a while, but eventually he decides to venture out and make a name for himself. That he does. Tyrfing makes him invincible. He gains much fame and glory. Uh, he goes from defending King Harold's realm to attacking him and becoming king himself. King Heidrek has great success until he meets King Hrotlau, whose son he goes hunting with. He misses a boar with a spear and uses Tyrfing to kill it. The curse demands human blood, however, and the only other person around is King Hrotlau's son. So you can imagine 
the result is war. However, they're able to reconcile eventually with Heydrich marrying his daughter. One day, he meets Odin in disguise, who has a riddling contest with him. Heydrich gets angry, draws Tyrfing, and swings at Odin, who turns into a hawk and flies away. Strangely, it's not mentioned that anyone dies. Someone must, as Tyrfing always requires human blood. Maybe it's just some poor unnamed thrall, which is the word for slave. Speaking of thralls, Heydrich has nine of noble families who aren't too happy about their captivity. So one night they arm themselves, they slay the king's guards and kill him in his bedroom. They loot all the treasure and take Tyrfing. And that is the third evil deed. At least it's generally interpreted as the third evil deed. I would argue that technically the sword didn't have a hilt in his demise unless it caused him to lash out at Odin. I'd say unintentionally killing the son of a friendly king definitely counts though. Overall, the recurring theme is it's an exceptionally powerful sword that brings the wielder great success in battle. However, they always end up losing loved ones, often by their own hand, and eventually their own life too. Elric's cursed sword Stormbringer from Michael Moorcock's novels is directly inspired by this myth. And it also shows up in Dungeons and Dragons. It drains abilities, consumes souls, makes weaker enemies flee, can be summoned to the hand from anywhere, and the sword has evil intent. It can put the wielder into a berserker rage, and it especially enjoys the souls of slain allies. Tyrfing shows up in Castlevania Symphony of the Night as a cursed dark sword that does both cut and dark damage. It's got a massive minus 30 attack penalty though. So this is a very different take on the weapon curse. It actually makes it worse than a normal sword, whereas normally it's better, but with a catch. Uh, it also appears in the Fire Emblem games. Uh, they flipped it on its head because there is a holy weapon. It helps to protect the user from lethal blows when low on health. So uh, that's the exact opposite of the original Tyrfing, and the name is used in plenty of other games as well. Let's look at Japan, specifically the Muramasa swords. I'll try to get the pronunciation right, or at least close-ish. Although he's famous, there's not that much known about the blacksmith Muramasa, other than that he was born in Ise province before the years of 1501 to 1504, which is what his earliest work dates to. He was active in the late Muramachi period, 1330s, to 1573, he was a student of the renowned swordsmith Masamune, a name that you've probably heard before. Uh, Muramasa founded the school of the same name, which is recognizable by certain stylistic features, like a fish belly tang shape and a particular randomized wave hamon, although that's not present on all blades. Uh, they were known for remarkable sharpness and favored by the Tokugawa clan, at least for a while. In Japan, blades are said to be infused with the personality and moral quality of the maker. Muramasa was supposedly ill-tempered, violent, and borderline insane, and his swords had a reputation for being bloodthirsty, even to the point of supposedly compelling the user to commit murder or suicide. The source for this is the book Secrets of the Samurai, originally published in 1973, which in turn is quoting journals from the 1880s. Apparently, there are also folk tales claiming that once drawn, a Muramasa sword must taste blood before it can be sheathed again, much like Tyrfing. So the stories about the curse on Muramasa swords was stirred up by several tragic incidents. The first victim is Matsudaira Kiyoyasu, the leader of his clan in the early 1500s. There are two versions of the story. The first being that his retainer Abe Masatoyu resented him and murdered him with a Muramasa sword. The second one is a little bit more elaborate. Kiyoyasu was suspecting a spy when his most loyal retainer Abe Sadayoshi was rumored to be colluding with the enemy. Sadayoshi asked for an investigation, confident that his name would be cleared. Uh, when his horse got spooked and caused a scene, his son thought that he was being arrested already and jumped the gun, I mean the sword, and attacked Kiyoyasu and killed him before the guards took him down too. 
Sadayoshi was indeed proven innocent, but he had lost a son and Kiyoyasu was only 25 years old. The blade that took his life was made by Muramasa. Next in line of the Matsudaira clan was his son Hirotara, who was taken under Sadayoshi's wing. Uh, one night, Hirotara was stabbed by an utterly drunk, one-eyed retainer, though some say that he was hired as an assassin by a rival clan and got drunk to make it look like an accident. Either way, the wakizashi that he used to stab Hirotada had a Muramasa signature. Then we've got the first shogun, Tokugawa Ieyasu, the son of Hirotada and the grandson of Kiyoyasu. After the battle of Sekigahara, he wanted to take a closer look at a sword that cut through a helmet crest, and he cut himself on it and remarked, must be a Muramasa, which it was. There's this, another version of that story in which it was a Yari that pierced the enemy commander's helmet, and when he inspected it, he dropped it and cut his hand on it and joked that it must be a Muramasa, and uh, the owner confirms and when he was told that they bring bad luck to the Tokugawa family, he destroyed the spear and vowed not to use any other blades from that school. Other stories say he accidentally injured himself with a Muramasa blade on a different occasion, and although the cut wasn't deep, it was unnaturally painful. Then in 1579, his wife and son were accused of conspiring to assassinate Oda Nobunaga. So Ieyasu was pressured to have his wife executed and force his son to commit seppuku, which is a ritual suicide committed with a tanto, a dagger, by stabbing into the stomach and slicing it open. And then an attendant would cut off the head with a sword in one stroke. Guess what? The sword that his son was decapitated with was a Muramasa. Legend claims that Ieyasu banned all Muramasa blades, but apparently that's inaccurate. He may or may not have believed them to be cursed or a bringer of ill luck, and the Tokugawa family didn't accept Muramasa swords as gifts, but one or two were passed down in the family. Some blades had the signature altar to remove themselves from the reputation, but apparently there was no hard ban. And there's evidence that between 1804 and 1818 alone, 10 Muramasa blades were brought to a sword polisher in Kyoto for maintenance. On the other hand, as late as the mid-1800s, Muramasa swords were still considered to bring ill luck upon the Tokugawa clan, so its enemies liked to acquire them. There is also a swordsmith named Muramasa in the Marvel Universe who forged a katana for Wolverine out of a piece of his soul. This magic katana can cut through anything. Of course it does. And it also disables healing factor. Muramasa swords appear in the Castlevania games as well as cursed swords lusting for blood. I can't even begin to list all the games that feature the name. It's quite common, almost as much as Masamune. The recurring theme of a sword causing bloodlust could be interpreted as a moral lesson to warriors, a cautionary tale against recklessly drawing a weapon in anger or with careless negligence, or it could also be kind of an acknowledgement of the dangers that come with this profession. You know, if violence is your business and death, then it may sometimes hit people that you don't want to. All right, moving on to more recent examples. Haunted ritual sword possessed a woman with the urge to kill. You know what gives me the urge to kill? In Minecraft, of course. Clickbait. All right, so the traveling museum of the paranormal and occult was contacted by a Florida, I mean, Kentucky man, sorry, habits, because his son was messing around with satanic rituals and used this sword to summon demons. After it was donated to the museum, nothing happened for a few weeks. But then, at a strange escapes event at the Stanley Hotel, which is what gave Stephen King inspiration for The Shining, by the way, a young woman asked if she could hold the sword. And this is what happened. At the time, there were over 60 people packed into the room listening to Greg and I tell stories about the haunted objects, so I didn't have the ability to keep an eye on what was happening with the young girl and the sword. 
First off, can you say safety fail? Oh yeah, 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 handle the sword. I'm, I'm not even gonna look at you. You can do whatever you want. After about 20 minutes, an event goer pulled me aside and quietly informed me that she thought it might be a good idea for me to remove the sword from the vicinity of Maria. As I scanned the room, I quickly found the young girl crouched on the floor in the corner, the sword still clutched tightly in her hands, and a very strange, vacant look on her face. I was immediately alarmed. You don't say. What I had missed since I was busy with the other guests was that in the 20 minutes since she had appeared with a ritual sword, she'd started swinging the sword around violently, pointing it at museum visitors, and muttering about how much she needed to spill blood. I rushed to the corner where she was crouched, muttering to herself, and had to forcefully pry the sword out of her hands, which were both wrapped around the hilt, her knuckles white. She claimed that she had no memory of the incident, except feeling that there was something very strong, very old, and very dark about the sword. You know what is very dark? The utter lack of safety. You can't just hand a random stranger a sword and you just not pay attention to what they're doing. If you don't have the capacity to keep track of it, if you don't have someone else to keep track of that person, the total noob, you know, fumbling around with a pointy and possibly sharp object, uh, maybe don't do it? What the hell, people? We've had the sword examined by a weapons expert who explained to us that the object was not created with the intention of being a movie prop or even a historical recreation, as both the hilt and shaft are far too small, I'm assuming they mean grip. He believes the sword was specifically created for the purpose of ritual use. <sighs> you know what my guess is, what it's created for? Hang it on the wall. Just look at the thing. It's a classic low effort, low quality wall hanger, most likely made of stainless steel. Excuse me? It has since been cleansed with a runic binding. Well, thank the gods that this threat to humanity is dealt with. Second and final case is the cursed sword on Craigslist. Bought at an antique store in 1984, well, the seller said there is a 90 plus percent chance that it's cursed. Since it's been in my house, my life has descended into pure chaos. My knitting group came over and they all said they could feel a strange energy in my sword room. Who are you gonna call? Knitting group. I have a collection of over 100 swords. This is the only haunted sword. Since I got the sword, about three times a week a crucifix will fall off my wall for no reason. I am 76 years old. I cannot have this cursed item in my house anymore. Please take it off my hands. First off, sword granny. 76 year old collector of over 100 swords. That's badass. Second, from the 1700s, the time of muskets, small swords, broadswords, and hangers, citation needed. You know, it really reminds me of something. I can't quite put my finger on it. Hmm. Bought in 1984. Let's see. Two years after Conan the Barbarian came out. Oh, look at that. Yes. It's an Atlantean sword from the 1700s. Haunted. Seems legit. You know the one thing that confuses me about the story? Apparently, it was offered for $150. $150? You know, if it was something like, I don't know, $500 or, or so, then I would guess, yeah, they spun the story in order to jack up the price and interest the collectors. Because, you know, a haunted sword is worth much more than a regular sword, right? Uh, whether it be a wall hanger or not. But 150? Even a cheap Atlantean reproduction should be worth more. So, oh well, somebody got it and was sorely disappointed, I'm assuming. Anyway, that's all I've got. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you got in the right spooky mood. Thanks for watching and have a good one, folks. Of course, it's always one, always one left, bastard.